All right, welcome everyone to the part one of the evangelism workshop. So who here knows what a workshop is? <laughs> right. So a workshop like in woodworking or anything like that is you're, you're building things. It's your, you have an, a, a time or an area in which you can take to build, and that's what we're really doing with the faith. That's what we're doing with how it is that we evangelize and all that. We're building it up. We're building up our faith and building up what God calls us to do in that in evangelism. And so this is just going to be an introduction and a little bit into some methods of evangelism to get an idea of what it is that we do, what it is that uh, Christians should be doing in evangelism, looking at biblical evangelism and some other methods in which we can go about uh, sharing our faith. And so evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion or euangelizo, which means good news or gospel or glad tidings or proclaiming a message of good news. That is basically, that in a nutshell, evangelism is sharing the good news. That is what evangelism is. And so it's important to see what biblical evangelism is. Because in today's culture, you're going to have a lot of different methods or a lot of different uh, ways that people will define, well, this is how we evangelize. This is the, the right way to do it. Well, biblically speaking, biblical evangelism, it begins with prayer. That is first and foremost, it should always start with prayer for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in witnessing, in sharing uh, your testimony, you're sharing the gospel, and you're praying for open doors of opportunity, and also for a clear understanding of the bad news of sin and wrath, and then sharing the good news of love, grace, mercy, and salvation in Christ alone. And so why does evangelism matter? Well, there's a few reasons that I can think of that uh, show why evangelism matters. And first, it strengthens our faith. Like that is one of the uh, key factor in evangelism. It, it strengthens our own faith. Not only do we see people come to faith, but it is something that in sharing our faith, it actually builds up our own faith. It builds up our own uh, belief structure and all that. And in sharing the gospel, we're reminded of our own conversion. We're reminded of the gospel and the holiness and the love of God and the ways that we have seen the love of Jesus in our own lives and the Spirit's work in the years since we first came to faith in Jesus. And secondly, I've noticed in life that when I don't share the gospel or times that I go through and I, and I go through seasons of, of not sharing it, we can become rusty with the gospel. You know, there's a, an adage that if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, you don't lose salvation, but in a very real sense, as fall, fallible human beings, we, we can sometimes lose the, the sweetness of that freedom that salvation brings and what the gospel does for our life. And it's always good to bring that to the forefront of our lives at all times. And thirdly, it is uh, powerful for the life of the church. Now, seeing new believers in the church and hearing the testimonies, it brings a joy and vibrancy to the church. You know, sharing, like in our own church uh, here at Freshwater, we have that sharing time where we can hear sometimes about what God is doing in the lives of believers, and that builds up the faith of other believers. That, that strengthens one another. That's something that God is doing in everybody's life, and it's an amazing thing. And so when you see new believers coming in, that brings even more vibrancy to the church. And lastly, and this is really most important, it is God's method of bringing his people to himself. God could have sent the angels to spread the word, which would probably be more glorious than our fumbling words and the fact that we don't always remember everything and we do things always wrong. Um, but God chose to use us as believers to spread the good news of Jesus. So those are some key factors and why evangelism is important. So what I want us to do is to, of course, if we're looking at biblical evangelism, I want us to see some key passages about evangelism and why God does call us to evangelize, calls us to share our faith, and in multiple different ways. And so we'll go through a few of them. So 1 Peter 3.15, uh, if you have Bibles, go ahead and turn to them. Um, if you're watching online, we're going to have these up on the screen. But 1 Peter 3.15, this is really a kind of common apologetics verse, which apologetics we'll get to in the later sessions of this evangelism work workshop. Um this, uh, apologetics is really defending the faith or, or a way of, of bringing a defense of the faith. Uh, it's not apologizing for our faith in any way. It is bringing a defense of the faith to anyone who asks. And so that is 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope 
that is in you. In 2 Corinthians 5.11, it says, Since we know the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So uh, in many other sections of, sections of Scripture, it talks about how you know, Paul wanted to know nothing but uh, Christ and him crucified, and he came to the Corinthians only wanting to preach that. It's not to say that that's all he wanted to give a message for, and he didn't want to persuade anyone. He very much so spoke in many different ways, trying to persuade people the truth of the gospel and truth of it. And so as he shows when he was talking to them that we know the fear of the Lord, those who know the fear of the Lord will want to then persuade others to know that same fear of the Lord and the same love of the gospel. Romans 1 16 it says for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes and so this is a, a wonderful one for sharing the gospel because it shows that we can have confidence in the gospel that we don't have to trust in cultural relevance and we don't have to trust in our own skills and how we communicate or anything like that because the gospel itself as the Bible says is the power of God for salvation and so a lot, oftentimes people will get kind of scared and not want to share their faith because it's uncomfortable. You know, there's multiple times where I've even had to just sit and pray. It's like, God, give me the strength to be able to go out and speak it. And one thing that I've always, I've heard many years ago, and it always helped me was, uh, is to remember that awkward is better than no word. So being awkward in it is a lot better than saying nothing about it. Now, Ephesians 6, 19 says, Pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So we should be bold and clear with the gospel. We should take risks in sharing the gospel because it will ultimately honor Jesus. And we should speak the gospel, right? It's a message. There are words that we must communicate with that. It's not just our life. Now, there's a, there's a, a big push in, in evangelism in uh, modern culture to just live it out. Like, to evangelize, well, you can just live it out, and you don't really have to communicate the gospel because, well, it's, it's, it can be uncomfortable, so let's just live it out. And there's truth to the fact that we should, of course, be living out the truth of God's word in our lives, but the gospel is a message. There are words that we must communicate when sharing our faith. Romans 10, verse 1, says, Brothers, my heart's desire... And prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So again, it starts with prayer. Prayer for those you know who don't know Jesus. There are so many times where evangelism begins way before you strike up a conversation with anybody. Because let's say, for instance, you're, you're walking down the street and you may be seeing somebody that you've, you've seen run by your house multiple times or something. And you can be praying for those people way before you even strike up a conversation with them. You should be praying for God uh, always to be bringing them to salvation and opening their, their hearts to hear uh, the good news of the gospel. And we should always be praying for those. And even in the context of uh, talking with somebody, as much as you speak words of God to somebody, you should be praying to God about that person, like even more so. More than you just actually proclaim God to them, you should be going and praying to God uh, for that person's salvation. Now, the last verse to look at is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. And this is a big one for why it is that we're commanded kind of to go out and preach the gospel. It says, Now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In verse 18, it says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You see that? He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, and so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is the task of an evangelist. And not just someone who may be called to have that gift of evangelism or to go out and really make it their, 
life's goal to, to get a soapbox and a, and a megaphone and go preach the gospel on every corner they can. But that is for all Christians. We are ambassadors for Christ. And God is making his appeal through us. And so we implore others on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now evangelism, we can see from this, is not a work that we do necessarily for God, but rather it's a work that God is doing through us. It's his power through the gospel, and we proclaim that, uh, the, the gospel that we proclaim that saves others. It's God's work in that. We have a job as Christians, and we should never take that job lightly. The gospel itself is a message with objective power, and that is the message we proclaim. It is a message of power. It's a message of God's uh, righteousness. It's a message of our sin in light of a holy God. It's a message of what Christ has done on the cross and ultimately showing that our sin has been, uh, that we have that reconcil reconciliation as Second Corinthians tells us. So we hold to the truth of scripture in this and we never back down from that starting point. It's always about scripture. It's always about the message of the cross. And so evangelism methods. So how it is that we can go about sharing our faith and what are some, maybe some common ways that people have explained it, maybe some common ways that make it a little bit easier. And uh, if you notice, you have uh, two handouts uh, and we'll try to make these PDFs available um, on the YouTube video as well to be able to download for yourself. Um, but they're going to have a couple of them. You're going to see a Roman road and a 15 second testimony. But before we get to that, um, some other methods of evangelism that maybe are talked about often, uh, one of which is called friendship evangelism. Now, this is giving the good news over time through friendships. Now, I'm not generally a fan of this method because I feel that it is kind of stems sometimes from a fear of sharing the gospel, that sometimes we don't want to, you know, just jump right in there with this, this you know, spoken message of, the word of God. And so it's like, well, I'll just I'll give it time. I'll kind of, you know, slip it in in conversations here or there. You know, I'll just kind of, you know, I'll, I'll befriend this person. I'll take them to coffee. You know, maybe in two years, maybe then I'll share my faith, you know. But oftentimes, uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't go uh, as well as we would like it. So as far as friendship evangelism go, um, you know, it, it definitely could be a little bit better in that regard. But I, I think ultimately we should never want to back down or should we... Anything that gets in the way of us wanting to share our faith um, can sometimes lead down a road that we don't really want to go down. So that's one way. Another way is contact evangelism. And this is kind of that, you know, you, you maybe see it often in, in YouTube videos, or you maybe see it often um, in where people are, are going kind of door to door, they're handing out tracts, they're engaging in dialogues with strangers, just kind of randomly on the street or anything like that. It's kind of uh, also known as cold turkey evangelism. And that's a uh, contact evangelism. That's where you just you're going out and you make it a point that hey, I'm going to spend this amount of time, you know, just going out and walking on the street, maybe with some some tracks and trying to st strike up conversations, trying to talk with people in that regard. Now, this one's one of my uh, kind of go-to ones if I don't have anything planned out or anything like that. Like it's just it's an easy way of of doing it. Like and this is the one that generally scares the people the most. And even me, being more of an introverted person, it terrifies me so i kind of have to definitely pray beforehand and go okay this is going to be this is difficult i don't i don't like talking to people and so it's just going to really be a difficult thing but the nice thing about tracks and having little uh things that you can hand out to people it's a great conversation starter and again if we just get over that fear of sharing our faith if we get over that fear that really holds us back uh that's really the the easiest part of evangelism. That's what makes evangelism easy, I should say. Once that fear is gone, because really what holds us back the most is that fear. And so once we get over that, and once we recognize that it's like, you know, I don't care if this person thinks that I'm foolish. I don't think this person thinks that I'm, I'm silly for believing this. Like the Bible tells us that most of the time an unbeliever is going to find the gospel foolish. You know, the, the, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved, it is the power of God. And so we, we, if we come to that understanding, we have that in the back of our heads and the back of our minds as we go out that it goes, yeah, okay, yep, yep, I'm a weirdo. Like, I believe in Jesus. I, I think it's all true. You know, if we get over that, then there's nothing that they're going to say that's going to cause us to want to back down. But there are um, some other ways that help us in kind of giving guidelines and how it is that we can 
share our faith effectively, how it is that we can uh, have something so that if we do get tripped up, or as I said, you know, awkward's better than no word, when we start getting awkward, what is it that we can do to maybe help keep it on track? And so we don't start, you know, kind of going off the rails. And because a lot of the times, and we'll get to this in the more apologetics version of this one, of this teaching, is a lot of the times when you're engaging in a conversation, the, the person you're talking to, if, especially if they're like a militant atheist or someone who really doesn't believe or is really hostile towards the faith, they're going to try to derail the conversation often. They're going to try to find different ways to be like, yeah, well, what about this? You know, the church does this kind of stuff or, you know, the church is terrible in this regard or, you know, believing in the Bible is ridiculous for this reason. They're going to throw a whole bunch of different stuff at you to really throw you off. But, you know, and those are good conversations to get in at times, but often is not always where you need to be. You know, it's not always what they need to hear, you know, and if you... I uh, want to stay on track with someone there's a there's good ways of doing that one for instance you have the sheet with you it's called the roman road this is one that's been used for for decades now and it's really all throughout the book of romans there are verses that really hit on the main points of the gospel and the main points of who it is who, who we are in light of a holy god our, our sin in light of that and what god has done through that and so we can go through some of that now as I said, you have a sheet in front of you. This is a resource for you to, to fold up, keep in your Bible, um, hold on to it. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have, just as a, as a quick reference. Um, I'm always for you know, uh, people memorizing this kind of stuff, even though I'm not good at memorizing these things myself, and so that's why I like having resources. But if you're someone who really likes memorizing stuff uh, and really wants to do that, these are great to memorize because then you can really get through these easily. So this is the Roman road. Let's start with the first one. Romans 3.10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So that starts off right at the back. As it is written, so it's talking about the truth of scripture. It is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one righteous before God. And that moves into the second one. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is our condition. It is the condition of all of humanity before God is that we have all sinned and we all sh fall short of that glory. So none of us hit that standard. None of us hit that mark that we need to. Romans 5.12 moves on to the next one. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So it's not just, you know, it's sometimes maybe easy for, well, I think I'm a good person. I, I'm all right. No, as the Bible tells us, all sin this spreads to all men. So no one is without excuse. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So our sin, that condition that we are in, the wages of that, the penalty for that is death. And it says, But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that starts to get into the good news. That's number five, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It shows what Christ, that God himself, though we fall short of his standard, God himself became a man and lived the perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again, uh, saving us from our sins. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart of man for with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And it moves on to number seven, Romans ten thirteen. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so as you're kind of going through these with somebody, it's it's good to be able to when you get to that last one, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. If they're showing a, a real um acceptance of this if they're showing that they're they're really broken by their sin if you've gone through this with somebody and they're really showing that that that's really where it, where it ends call on the name of the lord you know ask him to save you repent of your sins and turn to jesus now if you're one who likes to mark up in your bible i always think this is a good one um the, the newest bible that i have doesn't have it in there but i have a really old it was a really tiny one it's all tattered up now but it was one that i would have with me when i was out at times and um, it was a good one because what I would do is I'd go from Romans, the, the first one, Romans 3.10, and then what you can do is kind of circle it and draw a line from that verse 
and then write the next verse. And so when you see that one, you go, oh, this one goes to this one. And you can flip to that one, do the same thing. You circle that verse, draw another line to the side margins, write the next one. So it kind of just leads you through it. And you can just have the word of God open in front of you uh, speaking to somebody. So another one, let's say you don't have all the time to go through this entire section of, or the Roman road with somebody. Let's say you only have, as this one's called, a 15 second testimony. Let's say you only have 15 seconds, but I, I prefer more of a two minute because, you know, you never really generally have 15 seconds only to talk to somebody. But what this one, as the sheet says, uh, it's kind of the elevator pitch, you know. But this is a, a good one because evangelism, when we're going through it, a lot of the times evangelism can be as powerful as just sharing your testimony with somebody. Because again, it, just because, let's say, a, a, you know, God opens up a conversation with somebody and you don't get the chance to go through the whole gospel with somebody, but we can have faith that God is maybe working in that person's life. And so maybe we're just planting a seed. Maybe we're just going to do a little bit of watering of a seed that's already been planted. And, and we just have faith that someone maybe later on will be able to. But uh, if we only get like a little bit of time, this is one way uh, that we can do that. And so this is the 15 second testimony. And so if you notice on the sheet, there's going to be some blank spaces. I want you guys to, to write in your own words for this, because how this works is um, you basically use a simple introduction. Like for example, they have here, there was a time in my life when, you know, you can talk about what your life was like before. And so that's where you have the intro. And then there's the two lines that are before the cross that demonstrates what, what was your life like before Christ? What was it like before you did that? Like, for instance, you can write, you know, before I knew Christ, I was angry. I was hopeless. You know, you can use any other words. You can use, uh, just demonstrate truthfully how your life was prior to it. And the reason why I want you guys to be able to write your own stuff in there, because I want this to be more personal. You know, I don't want this to be a script that you just memorize and then you can just go out and say this for, you know, a 15 second testimony and be like, all right, I'm done. No, this is your own personal testimony. And sometimes that is just as powerful, um, if not more so, uh, to show someone that, that this is the truth of what it has done in your life. And so what you do is you describe uh, words, using words, uh, what your life was like before Christ. And then you can think of words uh, that describe what Christ did for you. You know, Christ saved me. He, he paid for my sins. You know, you can write things like that. Or, and then in the last one, uh, think of two words to describe your life after Christ. You know, now, uh, in light of what Christ has done for me, I have purpose. I'm secure. I'm filled with joy now in the Lord because of what he has done. And then you can just simply end with a question like, do you have a story like that? Or would you like to know Christ in that way? And just by simply doing stuff like that, maybe you can open up a conversation for another time. Maybe it's something that can give them something to think about. And then you can even give them your information to say if you, you know, you want, you know, because I don't have time to, you know, talk more right now. But, you know, if you have more questions, feel free to, to reach out. You know, a lot of the times if we're doing evangelism, especially locally, you might run into people more than one time. Let's say you're walking into a coffee shop and you, you know, have only just a few seconds to maybe talk to somebody who's, you know, there at the counter. You know, you, you can say, well, hey, I'm around here and I usually come through. And, you know, if you ever have questions, feel free to talk to me. It's opening up those uh, kind of more organic conversations that can happen. So that's just another uh, simple way that you can share the faith um, easily enough. And so uh, using those, I think it's good when you have things like that in sharing your faith, that what it ultimately leads to is a very organic way of sharing the gospel, a very organic way of doing that. Because I think that's really the way that evangelism works the best. I mean, that's the way that the Bible oftentimes speaks about so many things is in very organic terms. You know, it's rather than, than someone joining a club or, or buying a car. It's not like you're a salesman just trying to get them to, you know, close a deal or you're trying to, you know, get them to, to sign up for this. But no, this is really a method in which that we're trying to win souls to Christ, win people to faith in Jesus. And so when we do that, the, the, the Bible oftentimes speaks of things in organic terms. For instance, in Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, it says that same day Jesus went out of the sea and sat beside, or went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. 
and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, uh, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus here uses a parable of a seed being planted in the ground, literally an organic process. Remember, we're not, we're not car salesmen. We're not asking permission to give the truth. And, and the farmer doesn't get down and ask the soil for permission to plant the seed. They just plant it. They do so trusting in the process. And we as Christians plant the seed of the gospel, trusting that God will make it grow. It's God's work through us. And we see from these verses that there are, there are different types of soil that the seed encounters, but our job is not to take soil samples in order to see if the seed can be planted, but we should have an idea of what kind of soil we're working with. What kind of person are we working with? And so oftentimes if, if someone is uh, engaging in evangelism for a number of years or uh, a number of times that they're going out and sharing their faith, uh, that sometimes you can really get to the point where you understand uh, an unbeliever's condition and knowing the crowd, knowing it is who that you're speaking to. And 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light. So the, the scripture itself shows us that there are people in certain categories. There are people who are in the darkness. There are people who are in the light. And so when we are, are going through and speaking to somebody, there's about four different classifications that we can maybe find somebody in. They can either be in the dark with their eyes closed. So they're in the darkness. There's, they have no concept of God. They have no concept of that. There's, there's no, they, they have none of that in their minds. And the second one is they're maybe in the dark, but eyes opened. Maybe they're in the dark, but they have some understanding. Maybe, maybe even someone has planted a seed before. And so, so maybe the Spirit is doing a work in that person. And so the third one would be turned from the dark to the light. And then the fourth, transferred into the light by the grace of God. In other words, saved, born again. They're in the light. They're no longer in the darkness. And so with keeping these in mind, we need to ask ourselves, at which stage is this individual? And one way to do that is simply asking questions. You know, if you, if you always wonder, or if, if you're ever wondering what it is, how can I figure out where someone's at? A lot of the times it's just getting to know the person, getting to know them, asking probing questions uh, that kind of prod the unbeliever into, into to demonstrating where they are in that and, and to see if they're, you know, suppressing the truth because that's ultimately what's happening. An unbeliever is suppressing the truth of God. They know God exists. God's made himself evident, the scripture tells us, but the unbeliever is basically, as, as it's been put before, they're suppressing the truth. Imagine like a beach ball being pushed underwater, like they're shoving it under. And what we're doing is we're asking questions to kind of show like, oh, oh, see, see, you're losing your grip there. See the, the, the truth wanting to pop up, you know, because oftentimes when you hold a beach ball into the water, what's going to happen if you let go of it? It's just going to shoot right back up. You know, and that's oftentimes an unbeliever uh, is, is doing when you ask these kind of questions. And for instance, some of the questions can be, do you think you're a good person? You know, what's funny about that one is if they say, well, I think I'm a good person, immediately it's by what standard? By what standard are you a good person? And a lot of times they'll find different ways. Well, culturally, you know, I don't break the law. I don't do anything like that. Well, you can ultimately get them to a conversation about the, the, the moral law, the, the truth of what God has spoken to be right and wrong. Another question is, do you believe in absolute truth? You know, that's always a fun one. And I love when people say, like, I don't believe in absolute truth. Like, is that absolutely true that you don't believe in absolute truth? Another one is, do you believe there is, do you believe there is a God? You know, just simple probing questions. Have you ever been to church? Do you think there is an afterlife? And if so, where do you think you'll go? Do you know who Jesus is? Have you ever heard the gospel? So these are questions that we can ask to help direct the conversation along and trying to find out where these individuals are. And really listening to them, that's the important thing too, is we're not just, again, reciting scripts, we're not just reciting 
uh, information to get them to trust in, in Jesus. No, we're listening to them. We're really getting to know them. We're making the dialogue natural and organic. And of course, there are plenty of tracks and resources to show all kinds of ways uh, and questions to ask. And it's important to find out where they are spiritually because God may have already sent others, as I said, to plant seeds in this person. So we don't want to be putting more seed down instead of watering what is already present, you know, the seed that's already present. You know, 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9 says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who, plant, who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. You don't know how God has been working in someone's life. You know, that's it's a, a, a good rule of thumb when it comes to this. We don't know what God has been doing. You know, God could have been working on this person maybe just five minutes before even having a conversation with you. But we should be open to, to understanding that and opening to the, the spirit kind of prodding us and, and leading us along and where it is that we should be talking with them. So again, that's why prayer is so important in evangelism. And we need to learn about these people. We need to find out what they believe and try to, to gauge where they are spiritually and never forget to trust in God to bring the growth. You know, a lot of the times, and, and I, I, I'm a testament to this for sure, 99% of evangelistic efforts are fails or what seem like fails, you know, which can often, you know, lead someone to be uh, discouraged or tempted to, to feel discouraged in any way. But then sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're faithful in this and, and you've done it enough times, then there's that one out of a hundred that comes to faith. You know, that lost lamb that is found and is saved. And it's such a joy to see those who have been in the darkness come to light. It's an amazing thing to see. And so we must be, you know, ready and willing to see where God is kind of leading us in that. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, praying that that comes to, to fruition. And so another aspect of biblical evangelism is, of course, and this is probably one of the most simplistic uh, ways of, of, of explaining this, but know the gospel. Like, how you can't evangelize if you don't know the gospel. You know, you have to understand what it is. And so biblical evangelism is not a rigid, one-size-fits-all evangelism. Instead, evangelism must flow from a prayer-filled, God-centered worldview. We preach the truth of God by law, then gospel. And so depending on where they are spiritually, we can't skip the first step by giving the law because in order for the gospel to be good news, it presupposes bad news. Like there's bad news that must come before the good news. The law of God exposes sin in a person. We are all sinners. You know, as the Roman road uh, showed us and what scripture shows us all throughout, that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That is humanity's condition apart from Christ. And many people you talk with may feel bad about things, but they don't, or feel bad about the things that they've done, but rarely do they feel bad about what they are, you know, who they are in light of a holy God. You know, a lot of the times they'll say, yeah, maybe I've done some bad things in my life, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. There's no recollection of their sin as a rebellion against a holy God. And that's why questions are important. Questions that get to the heart of the unbeliever. Um, who here has ever heard of Ray Comfort in, in Washington? Yes, perfect. Ray Comfort is, is great. And he's good, I, I would say, at, at probing these kind of moral questions. You know, do you think you're a good person? You know, have you ever lied? You know, that's that Australian accent that I don't have a good one, so I won't do it again. Don't worry. You know, he asks questions like, have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever cheated? You know, it's keeping the conversation on God's moral law, exposing sin. You know, where then we can lead them to the good news of the gospel. Our task is to give the law which exposes sin in their life, and then the gospel that, then in the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. So we show them that they are sinners. But what we show them also, of course, what Christ came and did for sinners. That he died for them, and he was buried and rose on the third day to save us from those sins preaching that we must repent of our sins and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's in God's own time uh, to bring people from the dark to light. 
And so it's important to know the content in which we preach. And that comes from getting into the Word of God, knowing what we believe, and growing in Christ. You know, evangelism is only as difficult as somebody wants to make it. You know, it's only as difficult as the uh, 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 kind of the, the blocks that you put in front of yourself. You know, but it, in order to be uh, faithful and, and, and effective in evangelism, know the Bible. Know what the Word of God says. You know, live it. Have it in your heart. Have it in your heart and mind all the time. And when you do that, these conversations are going to come easy. The, these conversations are going to be uh, well, uh, well established. You know, as uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So, of course, you know, as much as we need to be in the Bible, we need to be accurately handling this word of truth. It wouldn't be wise to give the gospel to someone when you don't know it yourself. When you don't know the gospel, you know, learn it. Know it better. You know, and if you don't know the gospel, then, you know, maybe gauge where you are as a Christian as well because that is something that uh, you know if you're a Christian and you've been for a while you'll know what the gospel is and you'll know what it has done in your life and again be familiar with it be familiar with it in, in order to give it in just a couple minutes time or 15 seconds and that's why starting out it's good to use tracks or it's good to use effective means like this now oftentimes uh, as people are just beginning to get into evangelism or, or maybe newer Christians, uh, which I always find interesting because newer Christians tend to be better evangelists than Christians who have been around for a long time. Like Christians who have been Christians for, you know, 10, 20 years, oftentimes kind of get complacent, and pretty comfortable, but new Christians, they tend to be really on fire for just wanting to, to share their faith with anyone and everyone they possibly can. So that's great. But when someone's a new believer, they also, you know, Maybe they hear this from other people. Oh, I have to you know, go and evangelize or I, I should go do this. Well, what, what do I need to do? I'm, maybe someone's afraid to do it. Maybe they have, there's a lot of you know, hesitancy in that. Well, one way that, that helped me at the beginning was understanding that evangelizing is not just evangelizing unbelievers. And that might be interesting. But if we look at that, the word evangelize is an English word built on the Greek word euangelion or ungelizo which means speak good news, especially the good news of what Jesus has done in dying for our sins and rising again and forgiving us through faith. But the word evangelize is not limited to speaking the good news to unbelievers. It includes speaking to believers. And oftentimes people will be like, well, why would you need to evangelize believers? Well, Paul, for instance, really wanted to do that. In Romans 1.15, it says, I am eager to preach the gospel, evangelize, the same word, to you who are in Rome. And he was writing that letter to Christians in Rome. So he's wanting to, he's eager to preach the gospel to you Christians who are in Rome. Now it's a great place to start. If you're afraid, well, speak of Christ to fellow Christians. You know, get accustomed to speaking in conversation with someone. And, and if you uh, have fellowship with another believer, like that's going to be a lot easier in having a conversation like that than it would be with someone who's maybe more hostile towards the faith. And so you can really get uh, accustomed to preaching the gospel and tell the good news to Christians and tell them what you saw in your devotions this morning, you know, for instance, or tell them uh, a good promise that's been helping you through tough times recently or things or a good word from God that you've heard that has helped you in times and and that, that Christ, uh, you know, the, the calling to mind the, the things like that Christ made you and, and bought you with his blood and, and all just the, the different aspects that can really lead into gospel conversations and stuff that really encourages you. Because that's the one thing as Christians, that the gospel should never be something that is just what we tell to other people. The gospel should always be something that calls to mind in us that, that really that heartfelt love of God. It is something that always calls to mind the love of God in our own lives and, and calls to mind the love of God uh, and what he has been doing uh, all throughout our lives and what the Spirit has been doing in us. And so if the gospel is that to you, if the gospel is always on your heart and mind, then, you know, speak it to other believers. Speak it to believers first. And then, you know, once you've you know got that down, then speak it to unbelievers. You know, but don't, of course, it's always good to uh, make sure that you are eventually speaking it to unbelievers, because again, they're the ones who are in the darkness still. They're not in the light, and we need to see that uh, from that perspective. 
Now, in, in closing, as a recap, when we evangelize, uh, when we share the gospel, we start with prayer. Like, I want us to see that, that we start with prayer. As I said earlier, and I'll say it again, as much time as you spend talking to someone about God, spend more time talking to God about that person. Like, in prayer, in, in, in praying that the Holy Spirit changes their hearts, because that's what's really going to make the difference. It's not your words, it's not your presentation of the gospel, because oftentimes we fumble, and we're going to be definitely awkward about it, and people are going to think you're crazy. And that's okay, you know, because it's the gospel itself, as we've seen, is the power of God unto salvation. And so it's the Holy Spirit working in the heart of an unbeliever that is going to call them to faith. And so we must uh, start with God in our thinking, uh, or start with prayer, then have God in our thinking, always. And we should know our crowd, and know your content, and know the gospel, and find out where that person is spiritually. So ask questions. Lead them to the gospel. And know how to give the gospel in just a few minutes. And if that's all the time you have, then that's all the time you need. Plant the seed, water the seed, and trust in God to bring the growth.